next to him so that the Maybe audio from him you know, feeds yes, into it. Okay, so we changed the, the mic. And remember to move forward. Okay. We shall sit in silence for a few moments as we each frame our own thoughts or form our own prayer. Amen. We will now hear from four speakers, um, Pam Carlson, Ina Marks, Joanne Engelke, and Eileen, please. You speakers can come up front, and I will put this mic by the podium, or they can stand independently as they wish. Pam, would you like to go first? Or we've got you busy, busy. benefits of unplugging something and plugging it back in are endless. <laughs> oh, on Fran, uh, we are here out of a deep respect for a one-of-a-kind one of friend. We will never meet another Fran. When I wrote what I would say, I thought about what I would miss the most about Fran and realized my attraction to her as a friend wasn't about her warmth. I can't recall one big hug. She wasn't my huggable friend, yet I know I'm gonna miss her very much from the day she left us until today. She was so particular, wasn't she? About so many, many things. And this could be annoying at times. Uh, I remember Marie telling me, the whole time I'm preparing food, she's like right over my shoulder. Um, to me, that was part of her charm. Uh, a woman so unique and so genuine with a quirkiness about her that was totally predictable. No surprises from this friend. Being friends with her was like having a personal moral compass with a very big brain and an even bigger heart. Do you remember several years ago that WWJD movement? What would Jesus do? We could do WWFD. What would Fran do? She was always pointed in the right direction, acting for the common good, especially when it came to environmental issues and social justice. She taught me and this entire community with the voice of a wise sage. She stood tall and strong for the oppressed and lived her life accordingly. She participated in every cause related to social justice, like the group formed to support a person who was recently incarcerated. That's just one example. More recently, she wanted to hire asylum seekers to do yard work at her home. In her professional career, she worked on behalf of the oppressed and recently shared a story of how hard she worked to save someone who was falsely accused. And we record our sermons every Sunday and we put them on Zoom. And there are two occasions when you can go on to Beverly Unitarian's channel, look at Sunday services. Uh, one, I think was August 13th and you can hear Fran being interviewed and it's it's, on it's it, what did I say oh no it's on YouTube our channel on YouTube and and you can see her being interviewed and it's just it hurts but it's wonderful earlier in the year in the spring for a service probably the um, uh, the green service she read a story to the kids and so I have her reading the story. So check that out. I think you'll love it. Um, I wanted to share with you the Emily Dickinson poem that so fits Fran. 
If I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. If I can ease one life the aching, or cool one pain, or help one fainting robin on his nest again, I shall not live in vain. Fran's life was not in vain. And I'm sure each of us here have many examples of Fran stepping up and stories about her generosity, her tireless contributions, and her quirkiness. So please share those with all of us later. You know, many Unitarians believe the only afterlife is the legacy people leave on earth. I believe her life and death, her life after death is in our hearts and in the stories we share with each other. We will never meet another Fran. Yeah. I now invite Ina Marks to come forward. Hi. Um, I met Fran in about 1979 or 1980. We were both public defenders. I had been initially assigned to the child protection unit or child abuse unit, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And then on very few days notice, I got moved to the appeals division. And there were still very few women period in the office, very few women in either of these divisions. It turned out that when I went to appeals, Fran was assigned to be my supervisor. Fran would have made a wonderful teacher because she really helped me become a better writer, writer. And years later, I could just almost channel her um, when we were in different divisions for a while and I was back in child abuse. And I just sat down and in about four hours wrote a very informal manual about how to handle those cases. And people told me it was better than anything formal. Eventually, long story, which I won't go into, somehow Fran also ended up in child abuse. For a very brief time, I was her supervisor, but then we fought the authorities and all of a sudden there were two supervisors. Fran and I divided up the, the duties. Um, and then we wrote a very formal manual, which got good reviews. But our time there was challenging, to say the least. Nobody wanted to be there. Um, it didn't get the resources that the other divisions got. And nobody liked being supervised by women. In fact, there was one really funny story. An older gentleman who had had a whole full career before said to Fran that she had no right to be telling him what to do because he commanded a ship with hundreds of people in the Navy, to which Fran replied, you're on my ship now. <laughs> um, so now for another cute story. For many years, Fran and I, who were like first line supervisors, and then there was a division head, then there was somebody above us and it was all stratified. Um, we had to evaluate people, but no one evaluated the supervisors. There came a time when someone had, with a division had had to evaluate us. And um, we believe that he was told he had to be particularly harsh. I have no idea what Fran did because Fran was anything but mean, but um, he, the supervisor wrote that Fran sometimes scared the people she supervised. I, on the other hand, was thought to be too nice and wanting to be liked. So I was very upset. Fran, on the other hand, wrote a reply that was longer than the evaluation. Um, I was very upset. Fran told me not to be upset. I said, but I think he called me a wimp. And, she's, and then she said, but what does that mean he called me? And I said, I don't know, maybe a witch. I was reluctant to tell the story and ask my daughter, who really liked Fran, if it, was okay. So can I say that at her memorial? And she said, of course, Fran told the story all the time. Okay. Fran and I didn't socialize that much while we were both working. We were both busy raising families. But after she retired, we enjoyed lots of things. We enjoyed the Art Institute and especially the Chicago History Museum. 
We also both shared a love of interfaith activities. I remember Fran driving me and a Muslim friend to a Hindu temple, and she talked, I think by then she had left the Catholic Church and was here, so she talked about Unitarianism, I talked about Judaism, and we had the Muslim and the Hindu. And we shared many holidays, being a Unitarian and interested in other religions. She celebrated Hanukkah and Passover with me. I remember one time, and in the Passover Seder, there are two parts, you have some prayers, then you eat, then you have the rest of the prayers. During the time while I was like getting the meal ready, Chris, who's about four years older than my daughter, and my daughter opened the window because it was really hot and somehow they pushed a screen out of the window and Fran is like we're going to end up in our own court they're going to accuse us of child abuse I'm like no no it, it's okay nobody was hurt um so um and I also enjoyed many ethnic meals with Fran she introduced me to Lithuanian and Polish restaurants we both loved um the Russian Tea House downtown. So that was one of our favorite restaurants. Um, so it was interesting what the pastor said about the afterlife, because um, even though I'm somewhat active in a small synagogue, I don't have a conventional belief about what heaven or hell are. And in fact, I'm a big fan of Twilight Zone. I still love the reruns. And one continuing theme that Rod Serling had was that heaven and hell isn't what you're told in Sunday school. Heaven isn't fluffy clouds, clouds and hell isn't fire and brimstone. Everybody gets the particular heaven or hell that they deserve. One of my favorite episodes was the same room was heaven to one person and hell to the other. Okay, so I believe that if there's a heaven for Fran, there are a couple of things. First of all, all churches, synagogues, mosques, temples, business places, everything is green. Um, based on one of our best events when we went to watch Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, the radio is always on NPR, and um, there's perfect justice in the world. So I'd like to conclude with one of my favorite prayers from my prayer book, which I've read on both happy and sad occasions. I read it at my daughter's wedding. It's written by an artist who was known as Judy Chicago. She was a feminist writer and artist, and it's called Merger of Vis a Vision of the Future. And then all that has divided us will merge. And then compassion will be wedded to power. And then softness will come to a world that is harsh and unkind. And then both, and then all people will have the courage to be both gentle and strong. And then no person will be subject to another's will. And all will be free, rich, and very. And the greed of some will give way to the needs of the many. And all will share equally in the earth's abundance. And all will care for the sick, the weak, and the old. And all will nourish the young. And all will cherish life's creatures. And we all will live in harmony with each other in the earth. And then everywhere will be Eden once again. Thank you. Joanne Engelke. Um, I don't like admitting that Fran is gone. Uh, she's a lovely person. She was gentle. We hear about soft-spoken people. She expressed her agreement and disagreement evenly, the same deliberate voice. We did pretty many things together, traveling, books, plays, walks. We took the train downtown, then the Zephyr, I think, from Union Station to Salt Lake City, and then a bus to Yellowstone. Yes, we saw the geyser and a bear sitting under a tree. Another park bus had taken us through Yellowstone. It was a wonderful trip. We wonder if someone we'd never traveled with, um, that is someone uh, lived, that we live in, live in together with someone for days, will work out. It was fine. We chatted during the long train ride and bedtime and mealtimes were even okay. I mentioned books. Fran was a reader and relished her time leading the Renaissance classes. It was always interesting to hear about them for me. I learned without going to class. I actually mentioned a book I recently read to her, and she wanted it when someone else 
another friend was finished with it. Um, she liked Shakespeare and court theater as much as I did. I was delighted she wanted to renew. I'll definitely miss our discussions about the plays and, and some politics with her on the way home. Um, something we had in common, though we went to different churches, was church. Um, I think you all here know how much she valued the castle. She was devoted to the church and active, uh, not only contri con contributing, we actively worked for recycling and the repairs that I heard about and came regularly until she became dependent on someone bringing her. Um, and she took me recently to Hegwish, her hometown, and described her childhood there. It was interesting to hear about a town I only knew as the way to the expressway to Indiana and Michigan. We saw the, her park and her neighborhood, and she told stories about the family and, her, and um, her, the area. I don't recall why we went there. It was a whim, I think. Um, she was game to do a lot. We walked the path. Um, that she or, or really I think Chris or the caregiver had found in Oak Lawn. It was a charming path in the middle of a neighborhood, um, but a real wooded and prairie path. She talked about walking a mile or so with Chris regularly. She just needed the assurance of his arm. Later with her cane, it became necessary with me also. Now Chris, we say our kids are pride and joy. Chris, as a lot of you know, was. He was a faithful son. He visited her regularly, often weekly. She got to be a movie buff and up on docu documentaries. She was so looking forward to celebrating her birthday with him. I hope to remember her chuckle, her voice, about his plan to go to church with her and then to dinner for her birthday. The other thing I know about Chris is that he went to special stores to buy her organic food and herbal stuff. Also, Chinatown. We went to Chinatown. We, um, we went to Chinatown, a vegetarian restaurant in Chinatown that Chris had found. She loved this particular dish, which I have to find out which it was. Um, and I'm not vegetarian, but it was a delicious meal that I picked out, so it was very good. Um, so she was a pleasure to be with, um, talking, uh, taking adventures with, and exchanging news about our kids. I'd rather think of Fran in the present than lament her passing. It's the only way. She was and will continue to be a wonderful influence in my life. And Eileen, please. Hi, my name is Eileen Cleese. Fran and I go back a long time. <clears throat> Her son, Chris, was an RE assistant when my sons attended RE here in grammar school. And when I had uh, the Historical Jesus Seminars here in the 90s, Fran participated. We discovered we both shared a certain religious philosophy of being Christian humanist. I'm more Christian, she more humanist, but it was a connection. And she and Alan Lindrup actually started Green Sanctuary in the uh, late you know, 90s. And I joined because that was a, a major connection for me, for this church, and you know what I considered important social justice. And you know during the years before the household hazardous waste, we had farmers markets, forums. Uh, Fran and I did open lands tree keepers program together, which is a very intense program on taking care of trees. Uh, she would reach out to other tree keepers to uh, help her with her own landscaping, as well as the uh, parks in Hegewish. Um, we would, we also worked together with the Southeast Environmental Task Force. And when Alan introduced the household hazardous waste as a, oh, maybe we can help the community in November of 2008, we said, good, let's try it out. Disaster utter disaster. For months, we had this huge excess of stuff that the Alderman Ginger Roo guy at the time said, you got to get rid of this. And we were scrambling to figure out how to manage this enormous outpouring of paint and hazardous waste and electronics. And Fran single-handedly found COM2, an organization that was licensed uh, and certified by the state of Illinois to collect electronics 
and they came, you know, we got our collections down to something a little more manageable. You, you know, it was like quarterly and then, uh, you know, semi-annually and finally annually. But they came and collected all the electronics, palletized it, you know, and they, they obviously were recycling. There was some money in it for them, but they didn't charge us. And they did that for at least 10 years. Eventually, that no charge situation changed. And the last few collections we did, I, you know, drove a truck, Alan drove a truck, and that's what we did. But I handled the household stuff, you know, the bad stuff with Marty Garcia at Goose Island. And Fred took care of the publicity, getting volunteers, you know, the COM2 coordination. And we really worked as a team. And, you know, the physical demands on on us both were really amazing and we were glad to have the help we got from this community but i'm telling you we did a, a, a huge chunk of the work and the uh and the other things we did i mean we did a book club together that alan's still leading and we'd have arguments i mean i'd go to her place and we had our green sanctuary meetings there and she and i had different politics i'm libertarian she's very progressive we would occasionally meet in the middle, but only occasionally. And uh, she had, we had disagreements about Bill Gates and GMOs <laughs> and uh, some other areas. You know, I, I, but, but we always, but we never had a problem with that. We kept open minds on each other's um, points of view. Um, the other thing we did were Earth Day services, which we did a long time here, and they were good. Most of the time, they were very good, and Fran was frequently the, um, you know, the, 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 the spearheader for those services, and she would enroll me to um, make sure they happened. You know, sometimes my job was just to do publicity for our events, which I did a lot of flyers, a lot of passing around, a lot of coordination with the various groups. You know, we did household hazardous waste in the ninth ward, the 10th ward, we tried to do them in the 21st ward. And, um, uh, and of course, Alan did it in the um, in Hyde Park. And eventually, he's, I think, doing still in Park Forest. But bottom line, we had a connection that was you know, particular was was powerful, and you know, and in some ways unique to this congregation. And I don't think the congre—I mean, the congregation would have definitely been poor without our green sanctuary activities and Fran's commitment to environmentalism. Thank you all. I will now read the poem, When Great Trees Fall, by Maya Angelou. When great trees fall, rocks on distant hills shudder, lions hunker down in tall grasses, and even elephants lumber after safety. When great trees fall in forests, small things recoil in silence, their senses eroded beyond fear. When great souls die, the air around us becomes light, rare, sterile. We breathe briefly, our eyes briefly see with a hurtful clarity, our memory suddenly sharpened, examines, gnaws on kind words unsaid, promised walks never taken. Great souls die and our reality bound to them takes leave of us. Our souls dependent upon their nurture now shrink, wizened, our minds formed and informed by their radiance fall away. We are not so much maddened as reduced to the unutterable ignorance of dark, cold caves. 
and when great souls die, after a period, peace blooms, slowly and always irregularly. Spaces fill with a kind of soothing electric vibration. Our senses restored, never to be the same. They whisper to us, they existed. They existed. We can be, be and be better, for they existed. You know, I'm not quite sure what Fran's concept of the afterlife was. It was brought up in a few of the comments here. But I can guarantee if she woke up surprised in front of God, God had some questions to answer. <laughs> when any one of us passes on, it's a reminder to consider our own mortality, to think about our own lifetime and its invariable end. Mary Oliver asks, tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Fran Soa was an exemplar of living intentionally and living well. In fact, I would have expected her to help me plan this service, except for the problem that she just wasn't planning to leave us, not yet. But we can take solace in the fact that she was clear-minded and engaged in expressing her opinions until the last. We will miss them. And now I turn this service over to you. I invite anyone in the room to briefly share a thought or recollection about Fran and how you hold her in memory. Any genuine reaction is welcome and appropriate here. You can come forward, or if you need, we can bring a microphone to you. Please speak directly into the mic, whichever one it is. And yes, everyone must use the microphone. Greg can bring a mic to anybody. I'm Jean Robinson. A lot has been said about friends uh, being the conscience of the community, and she certainly was my environmental conscience for uh, de decades. I think it's important to remember how ahead of her time she was. I was trying to remember if it was 25 years ago, between 25 and 30 years ago, she stood up here and held up a a single-use plastic bag and said, I'm going to try not to bring a single plastic bag into my home for a year. And I and my young daughter walked down to CVS to get something very small right after church, and they started to put it in a plastic bag. And I said, oh, no, <laughs> I don't want a bag. And I then started playing the game and I thought about Fran every time. Every time somebody tries to give me a plastic bag, I tell them I don't want it. And the reactions are so interesting. Everything from what to right on. <laughs> uh, but just, just in words. So people in the chat, if you have something you once said, please type it into the chat and we'll share it with the people here. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Oh, well, I got that phone. I got that. My name is Betsy, and uh, let's see. <laughs> well, when we had the hazardous waste, I would post. Uh, you know, flyers up in the businesses and make calls and everything. And she was all worried for fear. Uh, there weren't enough volunteers. And I says, oh, don't worry. 
and I helped her count the money afterwards. We helped her move from uh, I, 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 yeah, we helped her move from the east side of Evergreen Park to the west side, and it was a day similar like this, you know, cold and rainy and everything. And she would call me sometimes for emergency situations, and most of the time I would be willing to help her out, and I, we lost a very active member of this church. A uh, message from Alan Lindrup saying we started the BUC Green Sanctuary Program in 2003. <laughs> Thank you, Alan, for that clarification. My name is Keith McGrath. I I remember I uh, me and my brother helped move all of Fran's stuff out of the big house and went over to the house that looks like Mary Hopkins is over on the other side by the um by by the ice cream place in the bank and then I did the lawn and uh, I I helped I used my Ford truck to move all the take all the stuff down starting with my f-150 and then my green ford ranger and um and then barbara took care of her and then um me and austin and me and tony and and then my other nephew nicholas and uh, we, we are uh, we took care of the lawn and uh and made made the house look nice and most of the time we got a 50. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the prius was nice too uh, uh, ex except uh, i, I would have had her get a, a a ford fusion hybrid <laughs> instead Hi, everybody. My name is Stacy Recht, um, and I just uh, remember Fran as an elder in, in our community, in our church, and um, with a super sharp intellect um, and super sharp cheekbones. She's just a beautiful, beautiful woman, um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm sure she didn't intend for her funeral to have so many mentions of the words hazardous waste. <laughs> And I'll bring it up again because I, I'll always remember standing always in the rain, always in the cold with her um, after having been forcefully recruited for that work. Um, but, you know, it, it was her vision to remove the things that would harm us from the world and from the earth. And so um, it, maybe it is appropriate that those words enter here. Um, I'm going to miss her so much. and. Uh, I, there, you know, I think Pam, you said there is no, there is no one like Fran, and um, you know, hopefully I can prove you wrong on that someday, um, as I'll keep looking to her as inspiration. So, thank you. Hi, my name is Beth. Uh, Everybody's talking about helping her move. Well, we were supposed to get together for lunch and go to some spiritual thing out in Orland Park. So I drove to the old house because she forgot to tell me she moved. <laughs> and I ring the doorbell and the stranger answers. And she didn't know where she went. So I'm like, oh, thank God for cell phones. <laughs> so I called her up and I said, sir, you forgot to tell me you moved. She said, oh my God, yeah, I did. <laughs> so she gave me her address and we went. Well, now we had a good time. She was very interesting. <clears throat> uh, I'm Mike Wolf, and uh, we met Fran uh, getting involved with uh, after the beginning of the uh, Iraq War, and Stasarish for Peace started here, and Fran was 
all into that. She was one of the spark plugs. And then some of us strangers, we came in and kind of took over maybe, but, and so <laughs> just a couple of things. You know, Fran was very principled and very strong in her beliefs, but she wasn't, she wasn't a loud mouth. You know, so we'd be standing out there on the corner of a hundred, uh, started at 95th Street and uh, Western, and we went to 103rd and Western. But so we'd be making all this noise and uh, getting people to honk their horns. Fran wasn't, she wasn't down for that. She said, I'm going to take my sign and I'm going to walk the other side of the intersection. She, she did that. And, you know, she wasn't, well, maybe she was a little annoyed at all the noise we were making, a bunch of rapper rousers, but she, she hung with us, you know. She hung with us, and uh, she, uh, and, and we have discussions, you know, political discussions, arguments, <laughs> discussions, whatever you want to call it. And a lot of times, uh, she wasn't uh, a, a flaming radical, like some of us thought we were, or were, whatever, but, she, you know, we always had cogent, real, Remarks, never grandstanding, never, you know, showing off. But it was always something worth listening to and paying attention to. And, um, and there's so many other things, but I'll just leave it with that. Oh, and she, we would have a 4th of July parades, and she would open up her house, you know, and we had a really nice time. We all, Tony would bring his Swedish meatballs, and we had a wonderful time with Fran. We miss her. Hi, I'm Debbie. I'd like to piggy bank on that um, and tell you a little story, too, about Fran and Southsiders for Peace. I first met her uh, at the onset of the Iraq War when Southsiders for Peace was organized, and she was an active member until she died, and she's still a member of Southsiders Peace today. Um, but there was a time when we had a person early on, maybe two or three years as after the war began, that was disrupting our meetings. And she wasn't a bad person, you don't know her, <laughs> but she came to our meetings and she wanted to control the meetings and she had her own agenda and we had much difficulty with that. So we called upon Fran, who we knew had an astute legal mind, and she called a meeting, and she chaired a meeting, and she set down the Roberts Rules of Orders and said that this is the way we were going to conduct our meetings from here on, because we were having uh, secret meetings at some point just to avoid this one person. And she conducted the meeting, and after that, uh, although she was very strong, very resolute, but very kind, she you know, this is the way it would be, we voted on it, and that person never came back. So years, all these years after all the good works that Southsiders for Peace have done, she has been really a part of that. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Perrine. Um, I don't know exactly the moment that I met Fran, but I know she was a very generous, good-hearted lady. And piggybacking off of what Keith said, um, she recognized hard work and dedication. And when my brother did lawn work for her and everything else, when Keith couldn't, she overpaid him. <laughs> Okay, so she was really generous. And somebody had mentioned that Fran was very particular. Try cleaning her house. <laughs> All the knickknacks put back exactly where it was and everything else. And then when I was invited to clean, Chris, well, he's away at school, but I still keep busy, like, so he comes home for holidays. So the dust would be put back, that would be put there. And then one time, he had me clean out his closet. And I was like, okay what needs to be donated, what needs to be this, what needs to be that. And I cannot tell you the amount of chapstick and Carmex that I found as Chris was sitting over there at the edge, wiping his lips. I hope you had your Carmex in your pocket today, young man. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but I could say that house cleaning and spending time with her, we had a lot of good talks and conversations and she brought me out of my depression when I was in my mid thirties in between jobs and everything else. So she was very instrumental in doing things, molding our hearts and also as mine, our minds, even knowing she didn't know she was doing it. So she will greatly be missed and her spirit will always live in this church. Hi everyone, my name is Josephine Pogue and I just have a very short uh, memory, many, many wonderful memories of Fran as, as everybody has shared, but um, my mother also went to uh, school at 16, she finished her PhD very young, and um, although my mother wasn't a member of this church, when she had come to a number of events, she and Fran had kind of bonded over that pretty unusual experience of being that age and being um, at that level in their education. Um, and my mother, unfortunately, did not remain sharp as Fran did in her later years. She had Alzheimer's. But on the couple of occasions that she was here for an event or something, Fran was so generous in treating her as if they still had that same kind of connection that they had had over that experience. And, you know, even if my mom would get off track and be a bit garbled, Fran always was respectful in talking to her. And that was very, very hard to find at my mom's time in her life. And when she recognized that some of those things were kind of slipping away that she had always relied on, um, and I always appreciated that, particularly that Fran went to that extra effort for somebody she didn't know that well um, to acknowledge something and, and treat my mother that way over just that small connection that they had made over a couple of occasions of a shared life experience. And I think that that was something that was very much a part of Fran, a number of people have mentioned her generosity and the fact that she was willing to extend that to everybody, not just the people that she was close with or the people that she worked with on committees over and over again, but somebody that she just knew from the community over, you know, a, a shorter amount of time. So that was something that I will always remember about her, among other things. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jean Day, and I'm in the Renaissance program at St. Xavier that Fran was very active in. In fact, she was going to be teaching a class this coming this fall on um, intriguing innovations from the past that are now being utilized in new interest, interesting ways, sustainable farming, sustain, um, um, mushrooms and how they were used um, in the past, and now they're psychedelic mushrooms that are used for, um, you know, for health reasons, uh, the climate change and um, uh, sustainable energy. Sustain and it was, and we are continuing with the class without her in her honor. <laughs> Chris helped us by sending us the um, the uh, notes that Fran had on her computer. He went through and tried to find everything he could. She had found a number of, um, of uh, videos, videos that um, could, could help explain. There's one about the hyperbaric chamber therapy at hospital being used right now and, and how, how often things were possibly from the past and now are being used. And I just loved all of Fran's classes. They were all intriguing. She had speakers come. She brought up all different types of ideas together. And um, I, and she brought us to Hegwish to, um, to a community garden there. She'd often have field trips as part of her classes. And um, she, what else did she? she she would then have us go out for lunch and get to know each other, the people in, in, in the neighborhoods where she took us. So I think we were in Hegwish. We went out for lunch somewhere. And um, also, I was in the choir with her at, at St. Xavier's, too. We had a little choir. We were altos together, and that was fun. 
so was Donna, who's here, and uh, Malene, who's, who she contacted about um, doing the program on the hyperbaric chambers. But one time at St. Xavier, three of the faculty members from three different departments were going to do a presentation. One was from sociology, one was from history, I think one was from racial studies on the origins of white supremacy. And it was going to be held in the place where we normally practice for the choir. And Fran said, well, can we stay for the class? And we did, and we did stay for the class. And many of the students from, of these different teachers came. It was a full, large classroom. And Fran spoke up and asked intriguing questions. And I know those students were so impressed, <laughs> you know, that this little woman in the front seat, you know, just had questions for the faculty members. And the faculty members were also impressed. So um, we, we will be missing her at Renaissance very much. Um, but her legacy lives on. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Hello everyone, um, my name is Stephanie Durant and I wanted to uh, bring a little different perspective, I guess, on Fran. <laughs> um, when I heard that Fran had passed, it had occurred to me that I've known Fran since I was in preschool, and um, which is a long time ago. <laughs> but um, we're, we've aged well, but <laughs> no, um, but you know, she is such a force, or is, is still is, I think, through all of us, uh, such a force to be reckoned with. And um, one of the things that I was hearing as many of you were speaking is an interesting dichotomy. She was very strong and forceful in her beliefs, but gentle in some respects of how she expressed them. Someone said that, you know, she agreed with you and disagreed with you in the same tone. And, um, but what was interesting, that now that I think about it as a young person and having known her for nearly all of my life, um, is how much that kind of is in the back of my head and how that's in me along the way. I wish I could say I was as even keeled, uh, but I'm not, but that, that passion um, and that, these causes that she has chosen in her life to uh, speak and, and work toward uh, were so important. And the other perspective I want to add to that is, is that I like to think that Chris, myself, Matt here, Ivy on, on Zoom there, and many, many more. Who, I'm sorry, Mary's here? Where? Oh my gosh, Mary. Okay, sorry. We'll talk afterward. Um, <laughs> that we that we are a good cause. That her cause for humanity, the cause of the greater good, and the cause of of this generation, and what we have to take with us um, in brand's power is is really is really beautiful um i remember going downtown with her i guess with you chris and um she must have been working um for children i remember at the point i was very young but anyway the point is is that how much she believed in what she was fighting for is what i took away from that also the fact that she would go along with <laughs> My, my mother and I, my mom Kathy over there and I were uh, discussing about how uh, she and Eva uh, would be, uh, and Fran together would be, you know, um, and, and Mary's mom as well, um, that there would be all sorts of events that would need to uh, take place at school and um, her commitment to us and to creating a um, wonderful childhood for us and going along with what my mom likes to call her crazy plans and <laughs> all of these things, but the softer side, but also the softer side combined with that strong passion that Fran had. Um, my mom also wanted to make sure that I also uh, made note of the fact that she's uh, currently in an assisted living facility right now, but that my mom has become known 
with no small influence from uh, uh, as the uh, resident um, what recycler. Okay, so we all know in medical facilities, there's been plastic is everywhere, and you've got this woman here uh, who is collecting all of that and making sure that it can get recycled. And so her legacy is living on, living on in us, in all of you, and in every uh, important imaginable way. I'm just going to stand here. Well, maybe I'll. This is short anyway. Uh, I remember I'm part of the DePaul gang, and we would go out to dinner a lot. And we were eating one time, and uh, we had gotten to dessert. And Fran wasn't into dessert very much. And I was eating all the chocolate, and she picked up of chocolate and she said do you know the calories in this are as much as a half a plate of food and I don't know uh, we also traveled to Florida one time and we we stayed about a week I think and we were eating some of the time at home so we both bought some food and we were eating breakfast and she was eating her mung beans and I had my eggs and God helped me bake and I was embarrassed to make it because she was she was there and I ate some of the food that she had for dinner and that first vacation I ever well it wasn't always a vacation but first time I came home and I weighed less than, than when I went over there and I'm thinking I should be I should be more like Fran. Talk about your conscience. She was she cared about you too, you know? Anyway, thank you. One, one behind you, Greg. Oh. There's one over there. Oh, over there. Well we'll get to you, Jordy. <laughs> Hi, I'm a member of this church. My name is Pat Haynes, and Fran touched my life in a very personal way. Years back, maybe eight years ago, she told me about the Amuse camps, uh, adult Unitarian Universalist camps. And it's a singles camp, but it's for men and women. So she said to me, I'm getting older, and I don't think I want to drive the, myself would you share the ride with me? So that made all the difference in my life. I met Doug there. And so she really had an impact on my life. As Tony comes up, actually, I'd like to, uh, I'm Greg Lawler. If um, I just want to say, and this is summarizing what many people have said, as a member of the congregation, uh, Fran was both generous, kind, interested in the minutia, but at the same time was always there to challenge us intellectually, challenge us socially, to challenge us to be a better person because of her. It's just the kind of person that you really miss in a congregation. Hi, I'm Anthony Thompson. My throat's kind of a little bad. That's why I didn't want to get up here, but I'm gonna get up here for Fran, you know. And I love Fran. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I love Fran. We used to talk all the time about everything. This is one person I could talk to. I mean, about everything. We talked about social stuff, political stuff. And I remember my computer was out a couple of times and she would try to email me and she said, damn, won't you get a new computer? You know, I said, Fran, Fran, I'll get one, I'll get one. It's, it's the company really, Comcast. 
was kind of, you know, messing up my computer. So she says, you're kind of cheap, aren't you? You know, I was Fran, Fran, come on. So Fran called me up and says, could you pick me up? So I said, Fran, I don't have my car, it's in the shop. I got the truck, I'll pick you up. So I picked her up, my truck's old. Don't you get a truck? Come on, this truck is old. And I think after a while, she probably didn't want me to pick her up because she thought I had the truck. And I said, you know, but like I say, I love Fran. And I'm going to miss her. I think we're done. No? Hi, I'm Marcia Curtis, and some years ago, Fran and I went to VA, the General Assembly of the UUA in Minneapolis together. We took the train and shared a hotel room, and every morning at 7 o'clock, Fran was up flitting from place to place in the room. She had, she called it her yoga, but it was moving, not stationary. And I'd sit on the bed and do my meditation, and she would flit throughout the room. <laughs> and then when I got really involved with the U Prison Ministry of Illinois, Fran volunteered to be on the curriculum committee with me and she helped write the curriculum that we use in the women's prison based on the seven principles or six principles however many principles there are <laughs> so she made a real contribution to UUPMI and I will miss her. Well, there's one more important voice we need to hear from, and that's Chris. This mic was not made for someone my own. Very true, very true. So today is a really tough day for me, but you all really did make it easier. You took your time doing it, but you made it easier. I, I'm going to be honest with you, I wrote the eulogy to end all eulogies for today. Oppenheimer, the eulogy. <laughs> but I'm not going to make you sit through that. Instead, I'm going to tell you some stories, and we're going to be able to get out of here in time for the next event. There is food upstairs. I want to thank the women of the castle for handling that. I know I provided you with a borderline unmanageable amount of food. And I hope all of you are prepared for a competitive eating contest <laughs> because that is what's next on the agenda. We've talked a lot about my mother's various causes and all of the work she's done to make the world a better place. I could talk about that for seven hours. Feel free to time me later. I can do it. It's noteworthy, I think, that the course that was already brought up that's going to continue without her at the Renaissance Academy is called Solutions for Our 21st Century Problems. Because my mom was always on the hunt for solutions. That's why when she read about what was happening with bees, colony collapse, 
and the potential catastrophic consequences of that to our broader ecosystem, she sprung into action. She found the right native plants that would nurture and heal those bees. And she had them planted right next to the other native plants she already had there for the butterflies, for the monarchs, for all suffering insect life. Because my mother cared about all life, big and small. She cared about you, but she also cared about the ants. And that's part, as far as she's concerned, of living on this planet. As Howard Zinn would say, you can't be neutral on a moving train. The direction of the earth and the various trains of life are going in good places and bad places. And my mother believed that part of being alive, part of being conscious, was taking some ownership over the direction of that train. So I will say to you, if once the weather gets a little bit nicer, if you want to see a bunch of butterflies, all you have to do is visit my mother's yard. And I guarantee you, it will be beautiful. But I must also warn you, you will see a lot of bees. A borderline scary amount of bees. Because my mother's work on behalf of bees was very successful. And that's wonderful. It, it truly is. Though I will say I do worry about the people on her block who might be allergic to bees. And I hope they have their EpiPens ready. <laughs> if you're the praying type, keep them in your prayers. Okay, I'm, I'll work on that. <laughs> so another story that comes to mind is, so my, my mom and I, we, we had a lot of projects together because her passion for animals in the earth really rubbed off on me. And I remember being in elementary school and at my urging, she replaced all of my school's glue traps for mice with catch and release traps. And at this point, she was also, she was working an incredibly stressful and demanding full-time plus job. Yet she still and we were, we were living a good deal north of here, nowhere near any forest preserves. She still found the time to drive me to the middle of nowhere with a trunk full of rodents, <laughs> secure in their little peanut butter smudged holding cells. And we took them to the forest. Now, I don't think we realized at that moment that taking urban, urban vermin from indoor places to just random woodlands wasn't particularly beneficial for those rodents. <laughs> the main beneficiaries were the local predators who had the easiest meals of their lives. We were Uber Eats for coyotes. <laughs> we have some car heckling going on. <laughs> Feel like I'm back at the Chuckle Hut. Um, used to do stand up, um, not anymore. So, the important part of that story, though, is that our hearts were in the right places. A lot of people mentioned that they disagreed with my mother more than on occasion, and I was no exception to that. But I knew that no matter what the disagreement was, she always came at that disagreement from a true and authentic and honest place. She always operated in good faith, and her heart was always in the right place. Now, as I told you, when I wrote Oppenheimer, the eulogy, I went through her entire life. Instead, I'm just going to give you what to me is the most important part. 
Just give me a second. My mother overcame a lot. She went through a lot to protect me. There are a lot of women in this world who have children with men. And unfortunately, far too often, those women, because of structural reasons and other personal issues, are unable to protect their children from those bad men. My mother was a huge success in this department. She was an exception to that. And I will always be grateful to her for everything she did to keep me safe and give me the childhood she never got to have. I had a wonderful childhood and I had no idea everything that was going on in the background when we had unlisted numbers so that we could not be found. My father is legally not allowed in this country. He is somewhere in Europe, perhaps facing manslaughter charges. He, not even joking. So the fact that I'm here with you today and I've had such a wonderful life is a testament to my mother and her ability to learn from her mistakes and stand up to bullies and make this world a better place. Thank you very much. the time you must keep on 
We now turn back to our own lives and should always remember that we do just have this one wild and precious life and that living it well with grace and caring is the task of each one of us here. Francoa did this very well. May each of us in our own way make peace with Fran's transition and resolve to find peace in ourselves and in our own lives. May we hold true to what is important. May we know how we are blessed. And may we continue to live on both through and for our blessings. <sighs> Our service is completed. Go in peace, go in hope, go in grace, and go in love. Thank you. Amen. A message from the tech team. Um, this service will be posted on the Facebook page for Beverly Unitarian Church. So if you wish to watch it again, It'll be on the Facebook page for Beverly Unitarian Church. Or to see what you said. <laughs> I believe that the refreshment is upstairs. If anybody has mobility issues, please let us know. And we can either assist.